Wollstonecraft is often referred to as the mother of feminism. This possibly gives the impression that feminism only happened in and to white Western Europe, and this is not the case. But Wollstonecraft's writing has been hugely influential in shaping the trajectories that feminism has taken, especially because her work was so significant to various movements for women's suffrage around the world. Writing a century before political reform would establish women's suffrage in North and South America, the UK, Europe, New Zealand, Australia and India, Wollstonecraft was a pioneer, a true trailblazer and one of feminism's first articulated proponents. A Vindication of the Rights of Women is one of the first unambiguously feminist pieces of political philosophy. Wollstonecraft's argument that women's betterment would benefit all society, affected through political change and particularly the radical reform of national education, was truly unique for its time. For this, she is often characterised as being the first feminist philosopher. In 2011, Mary Wollstonecraft's image was projected onto Westminster Palace in London to raise support for a permanent statue of the author. That London is still waiting for this statue tells us something, I believe, about why her work is still relevant and why it is still the case in the early 21st century that we have yet to establish a society truly convivial to subversive feminist thinking. A Vindication of the Rights of Women was first published in 1792. It was an exceedingly controversial text. 19th century American feminists having resurrected some of the book's principles, it was not until the early 1900s and the birth of the suffragette movement that interest in Wollstonecraft's writing truly gained political traction. If you don't understand some of the language in it, you're in good company because this is not easy reading. Much of Wollstonecraft's language is of her day. The point, though, is to capture the essence of the work rather than get too frustrated with translating the detail. And the essence of a vindication is important, not only to feminist scholarship, but to liberal philosophy more widely. In a vindication, Wollstonecraft is crafting an argument specifically relevant to a wider social, political and economic environment. This is important to explain. Firstly, the 18th century was an important period of historical change and included the emergence of the concept of enlightenment, the gradual erosion of monarchical authority, especially with the French and American revolutions in the late 1700s, and also the birth of democracy. Second, Wollstonecraft speaks within and to an environment heavily influenced by religion, in which the power of the church is unmatched. Wollstonecraft's belief in the certainty of divinity is clear, and she answers to God, not to men or government. Morality and virtue are two of the most recurring themes of her writing, and Wollstonecraft repeatedly asserts that a proper education is composed of the early inculcation of moral principles. Third, Britain in the 18th century was a country of contrast and extensive social change. Characterised by the tyranny of the aristocracy and semi-feudal despotism, the Highland Clearances of 1750 saw many Scots outright evicted from their lands. Britain was also a country of war, often with France, and ongoing colonisation. 1757 sees the last independent ruler of Bengal defeated by the British. The US colonies at this point are still under crown rule, but not for long. Australia is invaded in 1788. Lastly, the everyday life of most British people at this time was of crushing poverty, limited access to schooling, malnutrition, bad water, dirty food and poor hygiene. The beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in 1760 oversaw thousands of people abandoned country towns and rural living for cities that quickly became overcrowded and dismally unsanitary. These intersecting themes and the background to Wollstonecraft's call for revolutionary social reform are the very heart of politics and international relations. Asking questions about power, privilege, the fight for an allocation of scarce resources, knowledge, education, participation, this is why I at least do what I do. For Wollstonecraft, Women's slavery is simply irrational, robbing a nation of key patriotic resources, 
While men who claim the monopoly of rationality submit themselves to the degradation and tyranny of despots, monarchs and authoritarians, this is hypocrisy. Quote, brutal force has hitherto governed the world, Wollstonecraft argues, while the science of politics remains in its infancy, end quote. It is simply not rational, quote, to force all women by denying them civil and political rights to remain immured in their families, groping in the dark, end quote. Only when individuals are free to pursue their own best interests will the best public, universal and happy outcomes be achieved. In this, Wollstonecraft is firmly a utilitarian, like other famous liberal political philosophers, especially John Stuart Mill, but also much like the liberal institutionalists who have become so dominant in post-Second World War international relations theory. Utility can mean profit, but for early political philosophers like Wollstonecraft, it is really only happiness. And as for J.S. Mill, Adam Smith and the like, for Wollstonecraft, the best action is the one that maximises utility. And individuals, maximising their own utility, also maximise the larger social utility. This is the core of liberal institutionalist theories of cooperation in IR. The best action is the one that maximises utility, and this results in the greatest pleasure for the utility of society, creating the greatest happiness, or common good, of the greatest number. For Wollstonecraft, reason is common to all souls, and men and women are equally capable of reason. They should receive the same mental and spiritual training, and are capable of the same intellectual tasks. They must be educated to be enlightened beings. The, quote, more understanding women acquire, end quote, the greater the common virtuous good is served. Quote, where is the sexual difference, asks Wollstonecraft, when the education has been the same, end quote. Argues Wollstonecraft, quote, let their faculties have room to unfold and their virtues to gain strength and then determine where the whole sex must stand in the intellectual scale, end quote. For Wollstonecraft, power is masculine. Order is liberal, moral, virtuous and aspirational. Justice is achievable, but only with significant civil and legal revisioning. Quote, nay, the order of society, as it is at present regulated, would not be inverted, for women would then only have the rank that reason assigned her, end quote. Revolutionary discourse, yes. Subversive rhetoric, not really. For Wollstonecraft, as for much liberal feminism, the existing political arrangements of classical liberalism are enough. Women simply need to be provided with what is good for them, or that which is provided to men. In essence, assigning women the rights of men makes men better men, because they are not then enslaved by notions of irrational grandeur. They are simply serving the common good. This is a highly critical stance to take in relation to existent societal norms in the 18th century, and it makes Wollstonecraft revolutionary. For example, famed Enlightenment philosopher and French revolutionary Jean-Jacques Rousseau had argued in 1762 that women be educated only so that they be pleasing to men. By today's standards, arguing for women having access to the same civil, legal and educational opportunities as men is hardly groundbreaking. Wollstonecraft is, in essence, making very sure to not ask men to give anything up and her language is careful towards, and often flattering of, masculinized power. She's also clearly not talking about or interested in working class women. Her women are often idle, vain, bored, and resoundingly middle class. They are certainly white. But while some have criticized Wollstonecraft's bourgeois elitism, others have noticed that she does recognize class interests as an important component of revolutionary social theory. While the redistribution of wealth may not have been her aim, the articulation of economic forces as significant to the status of women is an important point. For me, it is particularly significant that there is no natural order of things in a vindication, and Wollstonecraft does not submit to history's lessons to tell us how things should or could be. We are warned, in fact, not to find women's future in the meagre solace of historical precedent. History tells us that only very few women, 
quote, have emancipated themselves from the galling yoke of sovereign man, end quote, and only a very few extraordinary women have, quote, rushed in eccentrical directions out of the orbit of their prescribed sex, end quote. Importantly, women are not naturally inferior in any part of Wollstonecraft's argument. Women's inferiority is established, not by their comparative weakness, but by their ignorance. Education, equally applied to boys and girls, thus becomes the bedrock by which society is furthered. And in this, the education of girls and the finest habits of independence, understanding and reason must be embraced to enable the patriotic advancement of society as a whole. Wollstonecraft's opposition to nature, hinting at the artifice of dominant conceptions of naturalness, would become a much stronger theme in subsequent first, second and third wave feminisms. Outlining the constructedness of ideas about what women can and should do naturally, Wollstonecraft reveals how certain gender conceits are not natural but arise, often from a pursuit of power. This, for me, is the story of world politics in any age and part of why Mary Wollstonecraft's writing remains so compelling.